these are the natural kinds of incentives, the natural kind of processes that we would expect to, to be taking place on these lands based on the interests of the landowners, based on the, the, the fact that they're looking at their portfolio of assets, they're looking at their potential income earning potential. I think I said potential twice there. Last class, we had the decision of, we, we were taking the perspective of a resource owner, a forest owner, and we were thinking to ourselves, what's my incentive to clear cut versus what's my incentive to harvest sustainably? We had 100,000 tons of, of biomass in our forest. We could cut that down immediately and sell that at $100 per ton. Alternatively, instead of cutting it all down at once, we could sort of rotate our cutting and the, the natural growth of the forest would replace what we, we, what we had just cut down at sort of a constant rate. We would cut down just enough so that that amount would be replaced by the new wood that would grow. That ended up being an extra 5,000 tons of, of, um, of biomass that we could sort of get on an annual basis. And we were thinking about what, what, are, those two, what are those two values uh, relative to one another? So the first, the first question in this in-class problem is, what is the present value of, of the sustainable forest management strategy at a 6% interest rate? Again, the sustainable forest management strategy is we have 5,000 tons extra, which grows that we can, we can sort of skim off the top. It's not literally skimming it off the top like, like cream, but it's, you, you, you cut down some plots of your forest and that wood gets replaced uh, gradually over time and you replant. And so that over time, you sort of maintain the same stock of forest and you get, you get, you get a harvest of 5,000 tons per year and you can sell that at 100 tons per year. Question one, what is the present value of that strategy? That, that would be a strategy that you can, let's just say for our purposes here, you can continue that strategy uh, until the end of time. You can do that for, for uh, infinity, infinity number of years. Uh, and, the, and the interest rate is, is 6%. So that's the first question. Um, and then I'll have you think about what's, what's the break-even interest rate? What's the interest rate that would make it, that would make you just indifferent between the clear cutting strategy versus the sustainable forest strategy? So take, take a few minutes now and, and work on that. Ah, uh, there's a question in the chat about what to put in for the T value. Uh, you wanna put in infinity for the T value. This is a this is a um, infinite horizon problem. So you don't have any you don't have any any endpoint. It's it's uh, it goes on for the infinite the infinite future. Wait. So then, do we use just like B over R then? That that is that's the uh, that's the most direct way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is then, I found like the present value of like that five hundred five thousand tons of wood. Mm -hmm. um, I was thinking. Do I add, um, like at the end, he still has the 100,000 ton stock still left over. So am I adding that to the present value as well, like to the end? Well, the end, the end in this, in this uh, under these assumptions, the end is infinite. the end of the end of time. Yeah. Never mind. So you, you don't, you don't ever actually get there. You don't actually ever get to the end. It's infinity. So what did we end up getting for the, uh, for the, uh, for number one? So I did 5,000 tons times 100, mm -hmm. and then I divided that by the rate, which is 0 0.06. Mm -hmm. So if those values are right, then I got 833,000. Uh, I think you're off by a factor of 10. Factor of 10, I see. I think. Let me, uh, you said you had 500,000. Uh, you did this 500,000 divided by 0 0.06? Yeah. Let me just double check that. Oh no, sorry, sorry. Um, eight million. Eight million. Yeah, eight point yeah. three three mil is what this is. Yeah, yeah. So you're yeah, you're you're on the right track. That's that's the present value. That's the that's the under the assumption that you're doing that forever. You're doing the you're getting five thousand tons forever and you're just keep you keep rotating around and replacing the the the, the plot that you just cut down gets gets sort of replanted and a new plot uh, sort of reaches maturity. And you cut that the next year, and then you replant that, and then a new plot reaches maturity, and you and you cut that, and you get uh, that five thousand tons per per year, and that's that's an eight point three three million dollar uh, amount. Um, did anybody find the uh, the the break even discount rate? 
the break-even interest rate that would make the, the, the landowner indifferent? Uh, yeah, in the chat, we have uh, Sawyer has given us the, uh, the answer. That's a 5% break-even rate. You can think about, you want the question there is, what is the, what is the rate that will make the present value of the clear cutting, which is this 10 million, what is the rate that will make the present value of the clear cutting equal to the present value of the sustainable strategy? And if we just do some, we do some algebra there, we can figure out that R is equal to $500,000. Those are in units of dollars divided by the 10 mil. And that ends up being 5%. And that, that ends up actually being that break even interest rate, interestingly, is, is exactly the growth rate of the forest. We had 100,000 tons of biomass stock, which reproduced 5,000 tons per year. So it, it sort of reproduced. It's like the forest was, was an interest bearing asset. It's like the forest was, was producing interest at 5%. It was 5% of that wood, of 5% of, of the stock of wood was, was regenerating and growing producing 5% more wood every single year, we were able to skim that off with our optimal rotation strategy. And we were able to actually acquire that as our, as our income, our annual income. That was a 5% 5% growth rate. The 500,000 per year was like the interest, the interest on our $10 million forest. The interest on the, tel on the $10 million forest, if we use it as a forest, the interest on our $10 million forest, if we use it just as a monetary asset, is would be the 10 million times the uh, whatever R is. That would be the, the annual interest that we could get if we put that $10 million and we put that in the stock market or, or, or some other kind of interest bearing asset. And if we, have our, if we think about what that would be at 6%, that would be a $600,000 annual income, $600,000 per year. If we have $10 million of, of a stock of assets, which we can put it in an interest bearing account that will yield 6% per year. That means that we can get $600,000 per year. So this is some of the, these are some of the economic trade-offs that a forest owner is contemplating as they are deciding what to do with their land. So that, that's, that's kind of the question of, of sustainable, sustainable rotation, rotating your, your, your plots to, to get a constant amount per year and keep the overall forest intact versus the, the clear cutting strategy. Okay. So that's, let me, let me talk about kind of another, another concept that, that is important for, for the economics of forest, which is we just came out of this, this clear-cutting strategy. The other, the other way to think about this problem is, is how long between clear-cutting do we wait? How long, how, if, if we decide that we want to clear-cut, if, if clear-cutting is what we want to do, we want to clear-cut the forest and replant the entire forest and uh, wait for that to grow back and then cut that down again after some time period. How long do we wait uh, until we cut that down again? So how long between clear cutting is sort of what this next question is. So to think about that question of, of how long before clear cutting, let's recall what the growth function of a forest looked like, which was this logistic, this logistic growth function. This, we had volume of wood on the y-axis and we had time on the x-axis. And this, this forest, uh, Based on ecological principles, it grows according to this logistic shape. It's kind of an S shape. Starts with a, 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 a flat slope, increases, reaches an inflection point, and then starts to level off as it gets older and older. And it, it start, sort of stops, it stops adding biomass at the same rate as it used to. Similar to the way that we had treated the fishery problem back in chapter four under the common property resource management problem, we took some information about how we would expect fish stocks to grow. And we multiplied that fish stock by the price of fish in order, in order to get total revenue. And we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to take this, this logistic growth function that, that shows the volume of wood that accumulates over time. And we're going to, we're going to multiply that by the, the price of timber. And that will, that will lead us to something like total revenue. So total revenue is going to have the same shape as the, as the volume. It's just going to be scaled, scaled up or down depending on what the units are. And so the total revenue will, will, will kind of have the same logistic shape. Total revenue and, and, and the growth of the forest is one component of the economics of forestry. Uh, but another important component, if we're thinking about the economics of forestry and forest resources, the other important component is the cost of harvesting. So this total cost of harvesting, uh, there's, this figure is given in the book. And I'm going to try to explain the intuition for why this total cost function has the, the shape 
that it does relative to the total revenue function. The idea is that um, it's going to have a similar shape to the total volume of wood because each additional volume of wood that grows, if you want to harvest it, you have to use some labor, use some fuel, uh, keep your machines operating, do whatever you kind of need to do to go into the forest and actually do the, the, the literal cutting, which, which will be an increasing function of how much wood there is. So this will increase with the amount of wood, but it won't increase at the same rate as as the amount of wood, you know, the, the extra revenue you get from, from each additional acre, the costs don't increase as fast for that additional acre to cut. But there's also, the important thing here is that the cost at zero, this is at time zero, the costs are, are some positive amount here because there's capital costs involved. It requires some capital investment in order to acquire the kinds of, acquire the kinds of machines and equipment that are, that are needed the the uh, the costs are going to involve not just the variable costs of of going out to the next acre and cutting down the trees, uh, but you have to invest some money up front in in getting the capital equipment that's required for this cutting. So the the costs at at zero are going to be high when you make the investment of um, you know when you make the initial investment of you can think of this also as being maybe the the investment you make initially to to get the trees planted to like to prepare the land get the land prepared. Uh, for for planting your stand of trees or planting your your forest that you plan to harvest in 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 uh, thir twenty or thirty or forty years time, that that involves some investment costs. So this cost is going to be high initially, even if even if there's no growth, and then it's going to increase with the amount of uh, growth because each additional uh, amount of wood that's required, uh, each additional amount of wood that, that that grows and that you could potentially harvest. Uh, is going to cost you a little bit more on a variable basis. That's why this. That's why this total cost curve starts higher than the the total revenue curve, and then ends up just kind of being a little bit flatter because each individual hectare gives you more revenue, or each additional volume of of biomass gives you more revenue than the the variable cost that's required to to actually cut it down. So we can take that that general shape. We can we can we can sort of keep that that general shape in mind. And we can notice that the the profit is negative for a large portion of of the lifespan of this forest up till up till this point here, we actually have negative profit, but we're willing to eat that loss initially because we're expecting we're expecting possible gains out in in the future and the, and the, the gains that we get out in the future are going to depend on how long that we wait. The longer we wait, if we wait you know just until a little bit after the point where pro profits are positive, we could get a little bit of profit. If we wait a bit, little bit longer, we could get more profit as the, as the wood continues to grow. And so the, the question for the, the forest owner, we're just thinking about this from the perspective of the forest owner. The, the, the issues that they're going to be looking at is how long do I wait until I, I cut these trees down? What's the optimal stopping point? Where, where do I want to stop? Maybe cut them down and then replant them again so I can do the same process over again. Um, so this, this, these are kind of their, uh, what their incentives are. We can, we can then think about not just total revenue and total cost separately, but let's think about total revenue minus total cost and consider what the, what the actual profit will look like. This is going to be, uh, it's going to have a negative value. Initially, we have a, a, uh, a negative, we have total cost exceeding total revenue in the beginning. Uh, that gap is going to shrink again as we, as we get closer to the, the point where these are equal. And then we would expect these to increase and maybe maybe eventually flatten out. But you know, it might become actually just a constant a constant amount as as maybe the forest begins to stabilize and maybe stops stops growing at a certain point or stops adding biomass. Um, so this blue line would be the the profit the profit that's associated with with the uh, with the forest the profit at any point in time. So this is this is time on the x axis. Profit is negative for a large a large portion of this. Of this time horizon, but then profit flips to an, into the positive range uh, after you after you sort of cross that red the the, th the threshold given by that red dotted line, the profit becomes positive, and then all of a sudden, um, then you're just deciding, okay, I can have some positive profits, but let me try to get as much as I can. So then the question is, how long do I wait? Okay, so the next consideration, um, if profit kind of goes up over time, we, we get some positive profit once we cross this this red threshold. But then how long do we wait? And this, this is where we have to bring the discount rate in again. So this, I'm going to say that this black line 
is undiscounted profit. And remember that if you apply a discount rate to something, it's going to reduce the, the value of that thing by more and more the further and further you get into the future. It's going to pull down future values a lot more than it's going to pull down uh, present values. So let me just draw a, maybe a couple different hypothetical profit patterns under different discount rates. So at time zero, this is going to be at time zero back at the beginning. This is time zero. Um, it's actually going to be whatever we, whatever we choose here for our alternative discount rate, it's going to be the same. Uh, it's going to be the same right here. It's also going to be the same right here because a value of zero, whatever value you discount that by, it's not going to change the value. It's still going to be zero. So these are two points that we know are going to be, are going to be the same. But the discount rate is going to make future costs a little bit lower. And, and then it's going to make future profits a little bit lower. And eventually we would expect to, to reach a point where, where the, the extra growth in the forest, the extra profit we can get is outweighed by, by the fact that it's occurring further in the future, which is going to have a, a, a more severe discount rate. Remember, we have whatever profit value we're dealing with is going to be um, profit divided by one plus R to the T. So as this T gets larger and larger, the value of that profit is going to shrink more and more. So that's why this, that's why this, this curve we can expect to fall uh, more steeply as, as, the, as time goes on. Just for the sake of, 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 the, of this example, let's say that that's a 3% discount rate just for concreteness sake. We can consider an alternative path. Again, this, whatever, whatever other discount rate we choose, it's still going to cross it's still going to cross this point at, at the same level because zero is uh, uh, zero discounted by any number is still zero. That's going to be still a point that we're anchored to. And also this initial point is going to be a point that we're anchored to because we don't discount anything at time zero. So um, this is going to be tricky to, to actually draw consistently, but let me just try to draw something here that's going to look like maybe something like that. That would be, let's say, a 6% discount rate. So profit continues to go up. With undiscounted profit, we have maybe a you know, maximum of uh, time horizon like that. Further off to the right, with, uh, with a discount rate of say 3%, our max profit occurs somewhere, somewhere around here, which is a little bit earlier than, than it was if we had no discount rate. And then the higher discount rate, the 6% discount rate is going to have a a time at which we achieve max profit, which is even earlier. So we get sort of a decrease in the time horizon when we go from no discount rate to 3% discount rate. And then as we discount again, that's going to that's gonna result in a, a further decrease in the, uh, the sort of the time interval at which it makes sense for us to, to harvest our, um, our stand of, of forest. So the principle that's at work here is that higher interest rates lead to faster cutting or Maybe uh, maybe earlier earlier cutting is maybe more specific. This is this is kind of the, the the perspective of a forest, or this is a this is a forest from the perspective of of a of a landowner that's trying to to make make as much of a a cash a a cash profit on their resource as they can. It's important that we that we take a a landowner's view of this because if we're interested in in considering other kinds of benefits that this forest might have we have to understand what the incentives are for the forest owner naturally and what they're, what the, we have to understand what they're going to do naturally uh, before we can figure out maybe how to design mechanisms that could steer behavior in a little bit of a different way that we might think is more beneficial for society as a whole. And so this principle here um, of how the interest rate, how the interest rate matters, we saw that the, that the interest rate mattered for the choice of sustainable harvest versus clear cutting. We also see that the interest rate matters for how soon a, 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 far, a, a forest owner is going to want to cut his forest down. One of the implications of this of this principle that higher higher let me actually do, let me finish this sentence here um, or finish this phrase. I I, uh, I think I have too much. I'm trying to think about it once. I don't remember to always finish my uh, my sentences. Higher interest rates lead to earlier cutting. Keep you know that that's sort of the principle that we can we can take. Uh, we can, we can keep in mind as we uh, as we consider consider this maybe from the perspective of forest conservation. The one of the implications of this, as a result of higher interest rates, let me clean this up. Forest owners forest owners will cut slow growing forests. Let me fix this up and replace with 
and replace with faster growing forests. That's that is something that we can we can we can predict that. Uh, this is some of the value of, of economics. Economics allows you to make a kind of behavioral prediction about about how how the, the composition of forests could change over time as the incentives change and as the um, uh, as the opportunity costs of, of forests change. So as there as there uh, maybe as as alternative investments come up, as as forest owners become aware of other investments that they could make, as they become aware of other kinds of capital markets, they'll realize that their forest is just one asset that they could be holding. Another asset that they could be holding would simply be a bundle of cash which they could, which they could put in some interest bearing asset in some kind of mutual fund, or they could put their money in the stock market and they could earn a return on that. And the higher the return is in alternative investments, the more likely it is that either the, the, the forest owner is going to want to clear cut and take that cash and invest that in something else. But what's also going to happen as the interest rate goes up, as we just saw in the previous discussion, is that as the interest rate goes up, um, you're, going to, you're going to get a transition from slow growing forests to fast growing forests. You're going to get some kind of adjustment in the composition, overall composition of forests uh, because, because the, profit, the profitability is higher for, for faster growing forests than for, for slower growing forests. So this, this principle here, this, this, this pattern that we observe around the world of, of old growth forests being replaced with, with fast growing forests, that's a symptom of, of these economic incentives. That's a symptom of the opportunity cost of money and the opportunity cost of land. So one of the patterns, this, this is in chapter 19 of the book, we have this pattern where, where slow growing forests, this, these are the, the pattern of, um, of uh, sort of how much there is over time. These are like the, the stocks of, of forests. So, uh, you know, you can think of that as being like tons, tons of, of uh, old growth forest biomass has been decreasing over time uh, as the process of deforestation has been, has been happening. As these, as these slower old growth forests have been cut. And what's replaced them is over time, as these have been cut, they've been replaced with, with faster growing forests, uh, you know, at some rate. And, and so the overall forest, um, if you think about the total, the total forest volume, uh, the, let me just label this, this gray is like the, the fast growing forest. As those, as the composition has, has changed, We've had the total the total forest volume kind of decrease, but then also um, kind of reach reach a minimum and then and then sort of uh, sort of not 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 continue to, to to decrease absolutely, but actually kind of reach a minimum and then start to go back up in a lot of regions of the world. This is true of the United States, you know, the U.S. and and Europe has this pattern where where total forest area is increasing. There's actually uh, more forests being being added, uh, so that the for the total forest stock is 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 increasing over time. Uh, other other kinds of uh, other regions of the world, like Southeast Asia and South America, haven't yet reached a point where where total forest cover has in, has started to to bottom out and then increase again. Um, those so some of those other areas of the world, Sub-Saharan Africa, um, Southeast Asia. South America, those regions have still are still kind of uh, seeing net net decreases in forests over time uh, because because those those haven't been increased those haven't been replaced with um, with with faster growing forest yet. But even even if even if these, this forest cover is uh, sort of bottoming out and then starting to go up again as as forests are being replanted, there could still potentially be some some losses in terms of um, you know the biodiversity or the ecosystem services associated with with fast growing forest versus uh, slow growing forest. So the slow slow growing forests or old old forests tend to have have high ecosystem services. There tends to be a, a higher diversity of, of tree species, which support a, a larger diversity of uh, Animal species and other other kinds of uh, wildlife species, whereas the the young, fast growing forests that are replanted, those tend to have a lower lower value of eco ecosystem services. All right, so this gets into a little bit of what what we had brought up in the 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 uh, the green accounting and natural capital 
sections where I talked about a little bit about payments for ecosystem services. We discussed, we just discussed the incentives of, of landowners and forest owners. Like I said, it's important to know what those incentives are so that we can maybe think about designing mechanisms for adjusting incentives and, and getting us more toward a, a level of conservation or a level of, of forest cover that's, that's um, trading off optimally the, the social benefits with the social costs. And that's what this that's what this payments for ecosystem services kind of scheme would be. And there, and an example of of how this has worked in the past, uh, Costa Rica has developed a pretty successful program, uh, which at least you know between the period 1997 and 2008 had a pretty uh, pretty successful payments for ecosystem services program. These consisted of five year contracts with with landowners. So they would they would they would pay them something like 200 to $500 uh, per hectare on an annual basis, which allowed the forest owner not just to, to look at, not, not just to observe that they could cut down their forest and, and see the monetary gains, but this represented a kind of a flow of income that they could, that they could acquire that would compensate them for some of the, the, the ecosystem services that are being provided by the standing forest. It's, it's not, it doesn't seem exactly fair that we would ask the, the landowners themselves uh, who themselves might be uh, might be very poor. It's a, it's not necessarily fair that we would ask them to bear the brunt of the, of the conservation costs. The benefits of those of those preserved forests accrue to everybody in in the form of water purification, land integrity, in terms of carbon sequestration. The benefits of that standing forest accrue to everybody, and it only makes sense that everybody would kind of pitch in for for the the provision of those services. And this program represents some kind of, of, of mechanism where that can happen. And, the, and these landowners can receive some kind of uh, annual payment you know, per, per unit of land that they, that they choose to conserve. They can receive some, some payment that will compensate them for the services that they're, they're providing the rest of the planet in terms of, of the carbon sequestration and, and, and water purification and, and contributions to biodiversity, et cetera. Uh, this is an example of of some of, of a program that uh, ended up, you know, conserving about 500,000 hectares over this this 1997 to uh, to 2008 period. Let me just bring up one one more point here, which which will kind of tie this together with the the other the other material that we had just covered. We just had we talked about how clear cutting. If we take the the clear cutting benefit and we multiply it by say a six percent interest rate, if, if the 6% rate is kind of the return that the landowner can get on alternative investments, that's going to equal a, uh, a $600,000 payoff per year. That's the annual income that's possible if, if that land is clear cut and, and converted to um, some other asset that bears, uh, that, that produces some value at 6% at per year. We had, we had the, um, at the 500 tons per year, case and at the price of $100,000 per ton, we had 500,000 per year that were possible under a sustainable management strategy. And so there's this gap, you know, at a 6% interest rate, there's this gap, there's this gap between what's possible under clear cutting and what's possible under, under a sustainable management strategy. And this is kind of what, this is kind of where the payments for ecosystem services could potentially stand in the gap and, and sort of make up, help to make up some of this difference. So if we have a, a possibility for, for sustainable harvesting of the forest, um, you don't need to compensate the landowner for the full, for the full $600,000 per year, which would, there would be their full opportunity cost under a 6% discount rate. You wouldn't actually need to compensate them for that entire amount. You would just need to compensate them enough to incentivize them to, to maybe switch, switch away from this clear cutting strategy to a, a more um, more sustainable strategy, and that would only require compensating them at the amount of one hundred thousand dollars per year. So, if if hypothetically hypothetically, if we had a program that was able to to uh, on an annual basis pay pay this landowner one hundred thousand dollars per year plus a little bit more, perhaps that would be enough then to to uh, give them opportunities to harvest some of it, uh, but also keep the overall forest intact and not not clear cut it, not destroy the entire habitat, but to keep keep that habitat preserved, which which would provide some of those ecosystem services that have value for society. And 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 the, the gap that you'd have to make up in this case, in this simple example, 
the gap would just be this $100,000 per year. Not, it wouldn't have to be the entire $600,000 per year. It would just be the gap between the payoffs under a sustainable management strategy versus a, um, a clear cutting strategy. And, and as, as, the, uh, as the discount, if, if the interest rate was even smaller, if the discount rate was 5.5%, then that gap would be, would be even smaller. So it would, de it would depend on what the, what the prevailing op opportunity costs and what the prevailing interest rate is.